This episode has been brought to you by Hunting Clash. Today we'll have a look at what might very well be the most bizarre building in New York City's history. A monolith, a giant marble obelisk with thousands of circular windows on its edges, curving inward to match a circular street. Recent renovations have changed this building's aesthetic to better match its surrounding, and although this new variant might very well be even more hideous than the previous one, it still manages to evoke emotion. So join Join me as we discover the history of New York's lollipop building. I'm your host Ryan Sokesh and you're watching It's History. This episode was made possible by Hunting Clash, an immersive, free-to-play game that gives you a realistic outdoor hunting experience from the comfort of your own home, available on both Android and iOS. The range of animals and locations will take your breath away, from the mountains of North America to the stunning Russian peninsula and the beauty of Africa. You'll track bears, wolves, and elks as you gain a new respect for the circle of life. Hone your hunting abilities with a bow or a rifle and upgrade your weapon as you keep playing. Master all the hunting skills with the skill tree. Upgrade them by collecting skill tokens to catch different prey. Play solo or test Test yourself against other players in one verse one or player versus player duels. So click the link in the description and use gift code Hunting with its history. New players get a reward of 100 gold, 70 skill tokens to upgrade your preferred skill and get more points when hunting, and two mythical lures for the mountain location, one for the grizzly bear and one for the mountain lion so you can hunt bigger animals, which comes to a value of $15. And now, back to New York's weirdest building. The story of the building on 2 Columbus Circle begins with the person who commissioned it, George Huntington Hartford II, who was one of the wealthiest people in mid-20th century America and held many titles from businessman, stage and film producer, hair of the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, or a &P, supermarket chain fortune holder, and most prevalent for today's purposes, an art collector. Basically, George was a baller, as his vast wealth allowed him to pretty much do whatever he pleased. Most of his indulgences were made possible from the A&P inheritance, which in 1859 was the world's largest retail business. Actually, by 1940, the Securities and Exchange Commission ranked his family amongst the wealthiest of the wealthy in the United States. He graduated from Harvard in 1934 with a degree in English literature and quickly fell out of his family business. Eventually, he seemed to find purpose when he acquired a yacht, which he sailed very frequently. However, with the outbreak of World War II in 1939, he donated that yacht to the U.S. Coast Guard, who returned the favor by giving him a Pacific Army supply ship, the FS-179, in 1944, which also seems to be a bit of an unusual barter. With the fiasco of the supply ship in the war's end, Hartford found himself on the west coast of the United States. He established a presence in Los Angeles, marrying an actress, constructing Hollywood's only legitimate stage theater at the time. He even went on to write some stage plays, which were of varying quality. By 1959, he found himself in some financial trouble. AMP had a significant dispute over the company's direction, resulting in George selling all of his shares in the company, totaling to $40 million, or $382 million in today's money. At that point, his wife promptly sued for divorce the following year, earning $1 million for each of their two children. The next few years of his life would see him selling off many of his possessions. In the throes of divorce, he had some time to consider the extensive collection of art he had gathered throughout the years, including pieces by Rembrandt. With all of this priceless art, he reasoned that it would be a shame to keep them just for himself, but he wasn't about to sell them either. So in 1956, Huntington Hartford acquired a lot in Manhattan at 2 Columbus Circle, surrounded by streets on all sides one of which was Broadway. He planned to use the area to construct a museum for his collection, bringing us to what would become New York City's weirdest building. The lot previously hosted the Grand Circle Hotel, a seven-story building designed by William H. Covet. It was a grand Victorian building that once defined 
find the roundabout it presided over. In fact, in 1875, the New York Times described the building as the most healthy location in New York City, likely referring to its location directly overlooking Central Park. By 1954, the city had demolished the building and its surrounding complex, leaving the lot that George now owned vacant. He planned his museum in response to the abstract expressionism art movement of the 1940s and 50s, which he wanted absolutely nothing to do with. He didn't just dislike the movement, he thought it was morally bankrupt and the worst thing that someone in the 1950s America could be communist. This is quite ironic since the CIA approved of abstract expressionism, seeing its abstraction as a representation of American free thought and markets. More importantly, it was a counter to the socialist realism art movement instated of the Soviet Union. Geopolitical art movements aside, George embarked on a journey to find the perfect architect for his museum. He eventually came upon Edward Doral Stone, the lead designer of Radio City Music Hall. Seeing him as a substitute for the job being a savvy proponent of American architecture and sharing many of his views on art, Hartford brought Stone on the project promptly. Stone had developed a dislike for the glass and steel buildings that had become mainstream in American architecture, so the pair sought to make the building more palatable to the average person, seeming to bridge the gap between the middle class and the cultural elite. The planned building was a 10-story poured concrete marble monolith with a concave north face that would match Columbus Circle. 1,472 bronze-plated windows dotted the edges of the building, supported by Gothic-style columns with Swedish red rose granite ovals. As nice as that might sound, the construction actually faced many immediate roadblocks. First off was a lawsuit from the Museum of Modern Art, which took issue with Hartford's intention to create a modern art exhibition that was admittedly very similar to what they were already doing. Stone had also previously delivered designs on a building of theirs, but despite the suit, construction continued, but there were additional complications along the way. But the most significant challenge came from what was directly underneath the building. Part of the building's design was an underground auditorium and administration area, but a solid rock formation was directly beneath the building, so suddenly construction required its workers to blast through rock, and since nobody planned for something like that, construction fell behind schedule even further. But when the building finally opened in 1964, it contained a collection of galleries, hosting both temporary and permanent displays. Below the lobby was the 154-seat auditorium, and above the galleries was a storage area, an administration area, a lounge, and a restaurant. And as benign as that all sounds, when this building opened, it created a tornado of emotion throughout New York. You see, two Columbus Circles breaking of American architectural convention drew mixed critical reception. In fact, most official critics gave it very negative press, drawing attention to the use of ornaments on modern buildings, its Byzantine styling, some even comparing it to the Dodge's Palace in Venice to draw attention to how out of place it seemed in the metropolitan of New York City. In fact, New York Times architectural critic Ada Louise Huxtable had something to say about it that would define this building's appearance for most of the years to come. Drawing attention to the granite ovals at the top of its columns, she called it a die-cut Venetian palazzo on lollipops. Forgive my pronunciation there. Critique so scathing that the structure gained the moniker, the lollipop building. That's not to say that all the press was hostile. One critic by the name of Stuart Peterson stated that there can be little criticism of the building itself, considering all of the maneuvering architect Stone had to perform to make this style work. The critics generally recognized that Stone's work on the building was undoubtedly impressive when considering all factors. The great news was that regardless of critical reception, the gallery itself became popular with the people of New York and beyond. Natives and tourists alike generally enjoyed what the museum had to offer, though those more well-versed in the world of art found its display to be generally unremarkable. But like with most great things, decline is a part of the story that's inevitable. 
The success was as fleeting as many of Huntington Hartford's other endeavors were. After only five years of operation, the museum closed its doors. Its operating costs could not cover the income. In total, it cost Hartford $7.4 million, or $56 million in today's money. And hence, Hartford sold to Columbus Circle to the Fairlight Dickinson University in 1969, which transformed it into the New York Culture Center. He relocated his art collection elsewhere and distanced himself from this failed venture. This sale marked the beginning of the end of New York's most unusual building. As you may recall from our report on Singer Tower or the downfall of Penn Station, new property owners have a tendency towards practicality in the face of expensive or unusual architecture. The building exchanged hands one more time in 1976, this time from the university to golf and western industries. Its new owners turned ownership directly over to New York City with the intention of its administration preserving it as a landmark, immortalizing Stone's masterpiece. You see, by this time, the building was a significant location to many New Yorkers, but there were still many detractors. The so-called Lollipop Building had not lost its nickname, but it had taken on an endearing meaning to some. The postmodernism movement especially admired the Lollipop Building for invoking classical architecture among thousands of steel and glass buildings, pushing the definition of the word modern. Unfortunately, several voices in the city's administration had a very different idea of the building's fate. Instead of preserving its unique classical build, some wanted to renovate it into a steel and glass structure to fit in with the rest of the city. They called it weak and claimed that its location overviewing Central Park demanded something much grander than a marble slab. The building's fate remained in limbo for decades, with the city revisiting the issue in the 21st century. By then, much of the support for keeping the building as is had died down. Although supporters were still very vocal about the topic, there were simply not enough of them. At one point, the building found itself on the list of America's 11 most endangered historic places, as arranged by the National Trust of Historic Preservation. Yet, despite the ongoing debate for the building's fate, the Landmarks Preservation Commission refused to even discuss it. By 2005, the Museum of Arts and Design acquired permission to replace the building's exterior after a long and very controversial battle. However, the controversy was not yet over and would only be boldened in the future years. Renovation plans pressed forward despite the opposition, and the lead architect agreed that the location called for something more. He even stated that those who opposed the renovation were a very small, exclusive, and elitist group that opposes most Upper West Side development. As the replacement work continued, many New Yorkers found that they missed the old marble the building had long displayed, especially upon seeing what was becoming of it. The renovations completely removed the marble, replacing it with a collection of asymmetrical and off-centered gray panels and glass. The brass-lined windows were removed entirely in favor of paneling, recalling a more average New York City building. Upon seeing this, many New Yorkers and the press immediately erupted in anger and disgust at the changes. Some claimed that it felt alien standing where the old marble structure once was and that if the city was lucky, no one would notice it. Others argued that demolition was its only salvation, as they believed the renovation was a mistake. Though it is worth noting that Mrs. Huxtable also commented on the new look. Remember, this is the lady who coined the term lollipop building. She exclaimed that criticism of the structure had been alarmingly out of proportion and flagrantly out of control. The Museum of Arts and Design moved into the new complex regardless of the controversy. And it's important to note that the interior renovation did a lot of justice, nearly tripling space that art could occupy, with 54,000 square feet of space. The museum now had more arable room for their exhibitions and events. And unlike the older ventures, the museum has remained open ever since, displaying art while some still mourned the old building for what it now lacks in artistry. Who knows, perhaps this was the point all along. Despite the controversy, changes, and somewhat questionable figures behind New York's most bizarre building, the museum at 2 Columbus Circle goes on.
it still sparks emotion and debate, which might indicate that the building, as hideous looking as it is, is a relevant and powerful piece of art. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section, subscribe and check out our video on Detroit's Book Tower. And don't forget to check out Hunting Clash by clicking the link in the description below. This is Ryan Sokash, signing off.